Hi guys, Olive here, here today to talk to you about the reading that I did in October 2022. I'm posting this wrap up a little bit early this month so that I can dedicate the entire month of November to nonfiction because it is about to be nonfiction November. I am so excited. But before I dive into all of the nonfiction content that I have planned for November, I wanted to take this look back at my October reading month because it was a really good month. I ended up reading a lot of good books. I read way more than I thought I was going to be able to, including what very well may be a new favorite book. We will start off by talking about fiction, since that's what I have been doing. And this month, I surprisingly read a lot of fiction, a lot by my standards anyway. And I read a lot of newer releases too. The first one I want to talk about is a book called Hester by Lori Lico Albanese. This is historical fiction set in the late 19th century. And it's a book that imagines that there was a muse behind the character of Hester Prynne in The Scarlet Letter. The main character of this novel is a Scottish woman named Isabel, and long before she was born, her grandmother was accused of witchcraft. So from her very early years, she is discouraged by her mother from telling people about what she refers to as her colors. Isabel experiences synesthesia. In case you've never heard of that, it's a phenomenon when a person receives one type of sensory input, but then perceives it in more than one way. Like Isabel in this novel, for instance, when she sees letters on a page, she perceives each one of those letters as being associated with a specific color. Or when she hears sounds, she sees colors. It's a very rare phenomenon. We know in the modern day that this is something that people experience and we know a little bit about it. I'm sure there's more that we will come to know about it in the coming decades. But back in Isabel's day, it didn't have a name. And all it would have meant is that someone is different. And for someone like Isabel, a woman, a woman with an ancestor who had been accused of witchcraft, it was probably better to keep it hush hush. Isabel eventually ends up in Salem, Massachusetts with her much older husband and circumstances unfold in a way that she has to support herself using her remarkable skills as a seamstress. That is such a cool part of this novel. But as she's doing that, she becomes intertwined with a lot of people in this town, including Nathaniel Hawthorne. Isabel carries many burdens on her shoulder throughout this novel, and she also starts to feel the weight of the secrets of this town, including the legacy of the witch trials and also the very immoral way that some of the people in town made their money. There was a lot about this novel that I liked. There are some stunning descriptions of the colors that Isabel experiences, which are not only beautiful to read, but it also helps you step into her shoes. It helps you be able to experience what she she's experiencing. And then also, obviously, this author did her research, because all of the different historical locations really come to life. It feels like you're there. And that really adds something to this reading experience. I was glued to this book for the first half of it. And then pretty suddenly, actually, in the back half, I started to tire of it. And the conclusion that I've reached about why that ended up happening is that I simply think this author was trying to juggle too many different plot lines. I can imagine that as a historical fiction author, it must be so tempting to include each and every last piece of research that you did to prepare yourself to write this novel. But I think it is so important to consider the reader's experience. And in the case of the back half of this novel, there were just too many things going on. It got way too busy. And I think if even one of those things had been dropped and there was one fewer thread to follow, if you will, since Isabel is a seamstress, then I think the overall reading experience would have been made a lot better. And then also at the end of the book, the author did something that I really don't like. Every last thought and feeling that Isabel was experiencing was spelled out right there on the page. I was left with no room to think for myself. And every single time an author does that, I really want to sit them down and ask them the question, do you not trust the characterization job that you just did? Because I'm of the opinion that, especially by the end of a book, I should know a character deeply enough that I can intuit what they are thinking and feeling based on what's going on around them. And when the 
author does all of that thinking for me, it kind of ruins the experience for me. So Hester was a very middle of the road kind of read for me. There's a lot to like in here, but then I think there are some flaws as well. I think if you really, really love The Scarlet Letter, then you might feel an extra connection to this one that will definitely make it worth reading. But if you don't love The Scarlet Letter, I think it's missable. But a novel that I read in October that actually did challenge me to read between the lines in the way that I wanted to when I was reading Hester is one of the best books that I have read in a very long time. It's called Sirens and Muses by Antonia Angris. This book is set in the early 2010s, and in it we follow four different characters who are all affiliated with this elite art school in New England. Three of those four characters are students at the art school. First, there's Louisa, who is is a scholarship student from Louisiana. She's looking to find a way to make her art distinctive. She really wants to make it as an artist. And then there's Karina, who is very much established in the art world coming into it, because not only is she the daughter of wealthy art collectors, but she also has tons of natural artistic talent. Then there's Preston, who is a senior at the school. He is an in real life troll looking to disrupt every space that he can get himself into. And then finally, the final of the four characters is Robert, who is a visiting art professor at the school. He's an artist himself. He is well known within the art world, but his star has definitely dimmed over the years. There is a love triangle within this group. There are beautiful descriptions of art, but also deep conversations about who art belongs to. There's political activism in the form of the Occupy movement that was going on at the time. And there is a nasty prank that happens that changes everything halfway through the novel. This was one of the most electric reading experiences that I have had in a very long time. I can't even remember the last time I felt this way about a novel. The writing is stunning. Let me just say that right out of the gates. But there is also so much to chew on within this novel starting with the fact that all of the characters are extremely flawed, but we don't just get to know them in the present. We also get to understand their backstories. So we see where all of those wounds came from. So even if you grow to hate some of these characters as people, and you will probably hate Preston, just trust me on that one, you can understand where they're coming from. All four of these characters go on these really intriguing physical and emotional journeys throughout this novel. But what I think I enjoyed most about it is how much was left unsaid. Now, a lot of this book is composed of philosophical questions, rhetorical questions that are meant to be more food for thought. They're not meant to have answers. So I don't mean unsaid in that regard. What I mean by that is that the author does something that I absolutely love. She presents us with these complex situations and allows us as the readers to fill in the blanks regarding the characters' thoughts, feelings, and reactions to these things. Like I was talking about with Hester, I feel like truly knowing a character happens in between those lines. I feel that I truly know a character when by the end of the book, I can predict how they're going to react to something, how they're going to feel about a situation, because the author the entire way through the book has adeptly, but subtly, shown me the core of who they are. I am just so in love with this novel. I had been waiting for such a long time to find another novel that would sweep me away in the same way that some of my all-time favorites did when I read them for the first time. I was actually really afraid after reading a lot of lackluster novels that I would never get to experience that sensation again. But I think I can safely say that I can count this book amongst my favorites now because I just loved it. I already want to reread it. I have a million different things to read. We're about ready to go into nonfiction November, and I still want to reread read it. That's how much I love this. <laughs> but then the next book that I want to talk about is one that did not impress me nearly as much, but it was fun. It's called Acts of Violet by Margarita Montemore. This is a novel about a legendary female magician named Violet Volk. She got very famous in the 1990s and quickly became a polarizing figure. She remained a polarizing figure following her disappearance. It was a very sensational disappearance because it happened in the midst of a show. She disappeared for her act and then just never reappeared. This book takes place 10 years after Violet's disappearance. 
Her whereabouts are still unknown. She's been legally pronounced dead, but everyone seems to have their own theory about what happened to her. Some people seem to believe that they're seeing her out and about. There's a hashtag about that trending on Instagram. Some people think that she's going to reappear at the memorial service that's being planned for the 10-year anniversary. In general, this anniversary coming up has drummed up a lot of new interest, and that interest inspired a new podcast about Violet's life and about her disappearance. We meet the podcast host. We get to see him trying his hardest to convince Violet's sister Sasha to appear on the podcast, which is a long shot because Sasha has been notoriously tight-lipped about her famous sister. Just like with Hester, there was so much about this that I did really like. First and foremost, I saw someone on Goodreads recommend the audiobook specifically for this book, and I decided to take them up on that recommendation. I am so glad that I did because this book works spectacularly on audiobook, especially because the producers of this audiobook made a real concerted effort to make the podcast within this book sound like an actual podcast, and it added so much to the reading experience. I also really liked all of this backstory story that we got about Violet. It really painted a picture of this hyper ambitious, competitive, but then on the other hand, generous and innovative, just in general, a wonderfully flawed performer. We get to know all of this just from other people talking about her. And all of those different perspectives really did help you understand why opinions about her in the public were so mixed. You could understand where each and every person was coming from because there was a lot to love about her, but there were some things to dislike as well. But the more I sit with the ending of this book, the more I don't like it. There's a piece of Violet's sister Sasha's backstory that is thrown into this book far too late, and it's obviously meant to explain away some of the sleepwalking incidents that Sasha experiences throughout this novel. And then there was also a lot of woo-woo stuff that I just frankly didn't feel was necessary. So it's not like I regret reading this one, listening to this one, whatever you want to call it. It's just that I think that this author's first novel, Una Out of Order, was a much better complete package. But there was one book in October that I do kind of regret reading, if I'm being honest. It's The Maidens by Alex Michaelides. I had heard so many negative reviews of this one, I did suspect that. I might not end up enjoying it. But then again, there were a lot of people out there who said they really liked this one. So I thought there was a chance, however minute of a chance, I thought there was a chance that I could count myself among them. And in the early parts of this novel, I thought that might end up being the case. I thought I could really like this because I really enjoyed this setup. The main character's name is Mariana. She's a therapist. She's been recently widowed. She's still taking it extremely hard. And as such, at this moment in her life, she is extremely extra close with her college-aged niece, who's always been more like a daughter to her. And when one of her niece's very close friends is found murdered on the Cambridge campus, she rushes to be by her side. But Mariana does a whole lot more than just support her niece emotionally. She becomes convinced that one specific professor is responsible for this crime. She only becomes more convinced after another person is found dead. She slowly starts to become more and more involved in the investigation to the chagrin of everybody who is actually investigating this case. And as she does this, she's putting herself and her niece more and more at risk. Like I said, at first, this was going really well. I was really digging the dark, tense atmosphere. I also am a sucker for any book that's even been remotely connected to a college campus, so it had that going for it as well. Sure, there was the occasional odd thing that I didn't love, like a random younger man love interest for Mariana that seemed very conveniently thrown in there, but I was willing to forgive it because generally I was having a good time reading it. I was really enjoying this book until I wasn't. I don't want to say too much about it because I don't want to spoil it for you. If you want it spoiled for yourself, there are lots of ranty Goodreads reviews that will do that for you in a very entertaining way, I might add. All I will say is that the resolution comes out of nowhere. The author did nothing throughout this book to earn that kind of a conclusion. After I finished this book, I sat there for a really long time, just kind of mentally recreating that Persian cat taxidermy meme. Why? Why? It was just so clumsy. 
And I've actually grown more irritated by this book as time has gone on as I've had more time to sit with that conclusion and really think about it and think about all the ways in which it didn't make any sense. So I gave this one two stars because I did really like the atmosphere. So it's a credit where credit's due kind of sympathy rating. Everything else about this, take a hike. Then the last work of fiction that I want to talk about in this video is a novella that I read for the spooky season. It's The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This is an allegorical tale about the good and evil sides of a doctor that I had surprisingly never read before. I thought I was going to read it and recognize it from my school days, but I don't think I actually ever read this one in school. And I found that my reaction to this was very similar to the reaction I always seem to have to the works of Charles Dickens. I really liked the story, but I did not care for the writing. I read this novella not just because it very much suited the spooky season, but also because I wanted to compare it to the Wishbone episode that was inspired by it. And that was a very dark episode. We'll just say that. If you want to hear more about this story, if you want to see how the writers of Wishbone took on this story, I will link that video for you in the description box below and up in the cards. The one written review of mine that appeared online during the month of October is one that I wrote of The Grandest Stage by Tyler Kepner, who is the baseball columnist for the New York Times. He wrote this very unconventional, more insider look at the World Series. I think this would definitely appeal more to people who are already baseball fans. I don't think it's meant for a more general readership, but it was a really interesting take on the World Series. And it's especially relevant right now because the World Series is going on right now. If you would like to hear more about this book, or if you just enjoy hearing my takes on books elsewhere on the internet, I'll link my review in the Christian Science Monitor in the description box below. But now on to the rest of the nonfiction books that I read during the month of October. The first one I want to show you is a book called The Fisherman and the Dragon by Kirk Wallace Johnson. Kirk Wallace Johnson is the author of The Feather Thief, one of the most interesting true crime books I've ever read. I am such a fan of that book. I know a lot of you are too. So I was so excited to pick up this book, which is his newest book. This one is all about a conflict that happened in the 1970s between Vietnamese refugees who had had been resettled on the Texas Gulf Coast, and the Texas fishermen, the shrimp fishermen who already lived there, they started blaming the really bad catches that they started experiencing on the Vietnamese refugees, when really that was caused by environmental damage done by local corporations. But they didn't know that at the time. And so violence broke out. And after a Vietnamese man murdered an American in self-defense, an all-out war started that came to involve a lot of different people, including a legendary attorney and the KKK. All the while, there was a different movement going on against those local corporations for polluting the local waterways and causing the core of this problem. Kirk Wallace Johnson is a very talented writer, so it was not a surprise to me when I found this to be very well researched and well written. I can recommend it in that regard. But I couldn't help but feel at times as I was reading this that it felt a little bit disjointed. I don't think the author did enough to tie these two different stories together. I think he just trusted that because they were two sides of the same story that we as readers would understand that. But I think he needed to do more to intertwine those two sides so it didn't read as quite as choppy as it ended up reading. There are some heartbreaking stories in here. And even though I'm glad I know them because I think it's good to be educated about these types of things, it could make for very tough reading at times just because of the heaviness of the subject matter. And while I generally can say that this was a good book, I am very sorry to say that I don't think it was quite as good as The Feather Thief is. Now, the rest of my October nonfiction reads all earned four stars from me. All of these I thought were wonderful. I would definitely recommend all of them. I thought I would mention that just in case you're looking for some more ideas for Nonfiction November. The first of that set is The Science of Murder by Carla Valentine, which is a book that talks about the forensic science that can be found inside of Agatha Christie's murder 
murder mystery novels. The author of this nonfiction book is a mortician. She's also a big fan of Agatha Christie's novels. And she breaks down this book by evidence type. Each different evidence type gets its own chapter, things like fingerprints, trace evidence, ballistics, and so on and so forth. She spends time talking about each different evidence type, what it is, how it's collected and then used to solve crimes. And then she gives examples of how each of those types of evidence can be found in Agatha Christie's novels. But she's very careful as she goes along to not spoil any of those novels for you. This book was absolutely fascinating. Even though it's a very morbid topic, this book is surprisingly upbeat. Carla Valentine clearly loves Agatha Christie, and that just sings through and lifts the whole thing. I loved how Carla Valentine spent a lot of time throughout the book showing how Agatha Christie would keep herself up to date with the newest science or the different cases that were going on in the world in order to make her murder mystery novels more more realistic. We get to see how Agatha learned more and then translated that to her novels, making them better, making them richer. So we get to see her development as a murder mystery author. This book made my inner CSI obsessed 13 year old self extremely happy. But I also finally read the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot. This is a very popular nonfiction book all about a Black woman named Henrietta Lacks. Her cancer cells were sampled without her knowledge back in the 1950s. And because her cells were so good at proliferating, those cells were allowed to divide again and again and again outside of her body. Scientists could use those to test things on and use them to learn more about science, to put it very simply. Over the decades, scientists have been able to learn so much because of the use of these HeLa cells, short for Henrietta Lacks. So the world owes Henrietta Lacks and her family a great debt. But the fact remains that these cells were taken from her body without her informed consent, and her family has not received any financial benefit from the continued sale and use of those cells. In this book, Rebecca Skloot breaks down pretty much every aspect of this story. She talks about everything we know about who Henrietta Lacks was as a person. We also find out more about the descendants of Henrietta Lacks and her other surviving family members. We get a story of those he HeLa cells, what they've been used for, why they were really good for testing, why they proved attractive to scientists. We get a background on why the Black community can sometimes be distrustful of medical institutions. This proves to be a good example of why that's the case. And then toward the end of the book, there is this whole discussion about the complicated ethics behind using so-called discarded tissue from patients, especially for financial gain. But for me, I think the most compelling part of this entire book, and I think it probably was for other readers as well, is the bond that Rebecca Skloot is able to form with the family of Henrietta Lacks. It was definitely an uphill battle for her, trying to get in contact with them and then trying to get them to trust her. They had been burned so many times, especially by scientists reaching out to them, wanting something from them in regards to the HeLa cells. And they just had a lot of mixed emotions about all of it. They didn't know how to feel about a piece of their mother living on in the way that it was, without their knowledge, without their consent. And also, it felt really bad to them that they couldn't even afford health insurance while scientists out there, companies out there, were profiting off of a piece of their mother. So it wasn't easy for Rebecca Skloot to convince them that she legitimately wanted to tell their mother's story. But eventually, she forms this beautiful bond with Henrietta Lacks's daughter, Deborah, And it's just so heartwarming. This book is just as good as everyone says it is. I am so glad that I finally read it. The only gripe that I have, it's a small one, but it's one that I haven't been able to move past. Throughout this book, everyone talks about Henrietta Lacks's cancer cells as though she's living on forever in the form of these cells. Henrietta Lacks was not her cancer cells. 
So if you want to say that a part of her lives on forever in the form of these HeLa cells, then that's accurate. But it is strange and inaccurate to say that she lives on forever because her cancer cells are still out there. In Henrietta's shoes, I would feel frankly insulted that you were comparing my cancer cells, not just to my healthy cells, but to who I was as a person. She was not her cancer cells. And I don't think I would feel the need to nitpick that if it didn't contribute to the actual title of this book. I know it's a very small issue. I know it is a nitpicky thing, but it is right there in the title of the book. I had to say it in order to tell you about this book, and I don't think that's the right way of looking at it. So it is a small issue. It didn't prevent me from enjoying all this book had to offer, but it is a part of it that I don't love. But then I read a new nonfiction book called Breathless by David Quammen. This book is a whole history of the science of the COVID-19 pandemic. Everything from where did this virus originate? Was it a spillover from a wild animal? Was it from an accidental lab leak like some people thought? But then he shows how everything played out from the vantage point of a scientist more than anyone else. What did the progression of our knowledge about this virus look like as time went on, rather than how were the different world leaders reacting at the time kind of thing? David Quammen knows a ton about zoonoses, or viruses that jump from the greater animal kingdom to human beings. He wrote a whole book on it called Spillover. I reviewed it here on my channel at the start of the pandemic. He started this book off with a really solid foundation since he had all of that knowledge. And it really shows this book is so thorough. But even though you can tell he was writing it in a way to try to make it understandable for non-scientists like myself, this book is still so heavy on the science. I tried my best to keep up, and most of the time I was at least sort of successful, but there were definitely moments when I felt like Kel Mitchell in Good Burger I was reading along like, uh-huh, uh-huh, I know some of these words. So if you're ready for that, then I recommend this. Otherwise, it may not be for you. But then the final two nonfiction books I read during the month of October were two books on bats. First, there was The Secret Lives of Bats by Merlin Tuttle, which is a memoir meets natural history book all about the author's lifelong mission to learn more about bats and to inform the public about the essential work that they do. And Flying Blind by Don Mitchell, which is another memoir, but this one is about a retired man turning a piece of his Vermont farm into ideal habitat for endangered bats. And as he was doing so, he used all of that time to himself to think back on his family's history and to take a good hard look at his long held issues with authority. These both were absolutely delightful just in their own ways. And I talked about both of them at length in the two books on bats video that I did toward the end of the month. In case you missed that, I will link it for you in the description box below and up in the cards. So so that was my October reading month. I have to say, I could not be more pleased, not just with the number of books I was able to finish. As I said in my October TBR, this is normally a very busy time of year, so I don't get a lot of reading done. So it was a surprise that I was able to finish all of these books, but I am more pleasantly surprised by how good they all were. I really enjoyed so much of this reading. This is the best October reading month I've had in recent history. So I am over the moon. If you have any comments or questions about any of these books, anything I talked about in this video, I would love to hear from you in the comment section below. All the books that I did talk about today will be linked for you in the description box below. Any other links that I promised you will be there as well. If you're on a mobile device, just tap the title of this video and that will expand for you. And at the bottom of that exact same description box, you will also see links to everywhere you can find me around the internet, including Goodreads and Instagram, the two places where I'm the most active, in case you would like to keep up with what I am reading and writing about right now. Thank you so much for watching. Happy early nonfiction November. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.